we are able to influence policy, we are able to ensure that governance is in place to ensure that people are doing the right thing and people are locating the right resources and utilizing those resources well for, for the good of the people. And with all the seats, and that is how WHO defines it, other people might define it differently, but those are the six building blocks of a healthcare system. So essentially, how do we as young people, or how can we engage health professionals to be able to participate in health system strengthening and basically in all the six areas. So I will try and limit myself to the, the guidance of the conference planning team. And when it comes to nurturing young workers to foster health system resilience, how can we train, employ, retain and develop uh, professionals who have this health system strengthening in mind so that even as you come out as a pharmacist, are you able to understand the entire system so that yours is not thinking about how do I dispense or how do I get a, a job at calls. So it's in terms of beyond what you're doing on your day-to-day -day life to look for an income, are you able to look at the health system in general and be able to influence the health system? So one is, when it comes to training, one, I think, the responsibility is to ensure that the train is the training that we get is optimal. What do I say? One is actually training the correct number. I think currently some of the biggest challenges, and I don't know whether do you have any medical students here. Okay. Yeah. So I think you will bear. Which university do you come from? Sorry to put a spot right there. You get one yourself. Okay, okay, maybe those ones don't know the problems of the, the, the university that I talk about. But anyway, I have, I have trained, I, have trained a bit, I, I had a bit of a seat at KMTC, so I see the challenges of the new, the new medical students in terms of the numbers. You're in a school which has 600 students, 500 students. So at what point do you participate in terms of um, getting to even be mentored? At what point do you engage with your teachers, with your lecturers? And essentially, I've had people even do ward rounds from the comfort of their beds. Where well, there's one student who's working, there's one student assigned to go to the ward, and the others are following on, on video, yeah? <laughs> no, you laugh at these things, but they are true, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, so those are some of the challenges that we're facing currently, and such kind of health professionals, at the end of their training, do you think you have trained that person enough? No. Or even the one person that you trained enough, there are hundred others that you didn't train well enough, which means it influences how the community perceives all of you. Whether you are the one person out of the hundred, you are the one who was holding the phone for the others. So it means that maybe you had the skills, the rest did not have the skills. So it becomes difficult for you to participate in the health system as correctly trained workforce if the numbers are not correct. In terms of training the right things, yes, as, as, as doctors and as pharmacists, nurses, or even public health, there's a core curriculum in terms of what you need to participate as a professional to either treat to either give public education, to either provide nursing care, but beyond that, are we adding into the curriculum the aspect of public health, community health? Are we adding health system strengthening? Or you're like us who, when it comes to those community health, community health uh, lectures, those ones are the breaks. Yeah. I think I, I when you went to do my MBA in Strathmore, I remember at some point we were doing statistics. And the people who had read statistics for the first time in their MBA, and this was taught in medical school. Because for them, medical school, during that statistics class, that was their break. Eh? From doing medicine, that's the time you sleep. Because you do not see these things as being important to you yet. They are important because, for instance, you're a surgeon, and you keep on seeing every day people coming with diabetic food and you cut out that food, diabetic food, and you cut out that food. But if you've, not, if you've learned a bit of statistics, you probably think maybe I need to look at what are the factors and maybe create some level of analysis for me to understand maybe it's the region they come from, 
maybe it is because the diabetic clinic does not run that way, they are not having their sugars control. So you need these things to be able to be a better clinician, even if you do not participate in public health. The other is in terms of employment. I think Dr. Frank here uh, pretty much, I think, gave a, um, a very good analysis in terms of what is the current challenge within the health system, and I will not belabor that. But essentially, again, in terms of employment, we must be able to innovate, or we must be able to do things differently, or even some of them go back to how we used to do them, which maybe broke down along the way. When it comes to residency programs, there are a lot of, um, let's say, young professionals who you get out of school, you do your internship, you, you're a pharmacist, or you're a medical officer, you're a nurse. However, there is no trajectory within which you upskill for you to go to the next level. And not all of us will want to do either a full on master's or I, want, I don't want to, to design my job to go and do a master's. But should there be residency programs which, trans, which transition very easily from when you're in internship, become a medical officer, you transition into residency, such programs. If you're a pharmacist, you, you, you once you do internship, you do uh, your pharmacy practice, you go into either clinical or you're taken into industry. But it's a there's there's a policy towards which how people go into those residency programs that enable you within the workforce to be able to upskill for you to go to the next level, which is currently an issue within our devolved or shared health function. Another thing in terms of employment, I would say is um, mentorship. And when I speak to mentorship in both ways, do we have a look, do we have mentors in place to be able to mentor? And also ourselves as young people, have we identified those people we want to work with? And possibly many people ask, how do I get a mentor? I think that's usually a very big question. How do I get a mentor? How do I even put myself in a position to know which kind of mentor I want? Um, so essentially, most mentors, it's very hard to write to, for instance, if I did know Dr. Joy, if I if she would receive an email from me saying, Dear Dr. Joy, I would like you to be a mentor. She doesn't know me, she doesn't even know what I like, she does not even know my whether I am aggressive or not aggressive. That becomes a very difficult way to engage a mentor. Usually the easiest way to engage a mentor, especially for you who have not joined a professional association, please do so. Whether you are in medical school, join Musake. Join, is it Lupsa? Yes, Kefsa. Join those, join those organizations. And from those organizations, participate. Don't join just to pay your membership and sit at the back. No offense to the poster at the back. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but don't, don't participate in an association by just showing up. Show your skills, and that is the only way you can be able to know, oh, by the way, David likes events, so possibly you might see somebody else who likes events and, and you follow them. Or even that person might spot you and say, by the way, whenever I'm having my next event, I will definitely call that person because they are very good at being a repertoire. They write very nice notes. And that is how you acquire mentors along the way. It's the easier way out as opposed to writing to random people or your university pushing you to have somebody who you don't connect with, because at, at a point universities try to create mentorship lists. Yes, sometimes they work in terms of the current subject, but in terms of your entire entire being, sometimes it does not work because maybe you've been given a mentor in surgery. Possibly they can help you improve your surgery skills, but they cannot possibly help you go to the next level as a professional. So that is from my perspective in terms of mentorship, how me as a young person I can access mentorship is participating in professional association. Put yourself out there, participating in events that you see certain people who maybe you know or you see that you want to interact with, know where, know where they go in terms of which are these events that I need to participate in for me to be able to access mentors. If it is your lecturers, ensure that 
if, if, if they do other mentorship sessions with other people who participate, then ask them for advice, see how, see how it goes from there, then you can see whether this is an actual person who I can call in as a mentor. Um, in terms of how do you develop yourself even within the workplace or before, what are these other things that you do? There are free access uh, resources also. For instance, I think Coursera does a lot of free courses. Which is the other place? LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning. Okay. Udemy. People know these things. So how do you develop your other skills? For instance, if I'm interested in health financing, you don't, yes, of course, at some point you might want to do a health financing degree or whatever, but there are free courses, even WHO actually runs a free health financing course. So I go to WHO, download do an online free course, which enables me to upskill, and possibly even by the time you're telling people, by the way, I have passion in health financing, they ask you, so what have you done? You say I've done course A, B, C, D, and I think I, I want this direction. So how we can participate in the health system strengthening is also learning those things. If you're interested in digital, uh, communication, if you're interested in leadership and governance, there's so many people who teach leadership and governance at that level for you to participate more effectively. So the, the last point I will probably mention is in terms of, um, not the last, second last, in terms of how, how can you invest in youth-led ventures. A lot of, I think a lot of youth initiatives which are very good suffer there. Um, what we call suffer the problem of not being able to value of the shadow of death. There's something called that in innovation. Eh? Value of the shadow of death. You have an idea, but getting that idea from an idea to something that is fundable, it's there's that value of shadow of death where many ideas die. Yeah? Very few get get through the value of the shadow of death. So essentially is to persevere with what you're doing. Yeah? If you've never had an event where five people came and you said you are a collective, you have not seen value of the shadow of death. If you've never pitched your product and not gotten a response from even one person, you've not gone through value of shadow of death. And that is where now resilience, if we're talking about health system resilience, the health system cannot be resilient while us as young professionals are not resilient. For some some of us to get to where we are. Possibly, I saw someone on Twitter who actually wrote uh, a CV of rejections. <laughs> and, and, and the reason they're writing that is because everybody was telling them, oh my God, you're living such a good life. I think they're a postdoc somewhere. So they've done their PhD, they're a postdoc in this prestigious Ivy League school, yeah? So people are like, oh my God, how did you get there? How did they posted a CV of rejections so that you can see how many rejections a person has gotten by the time they actually got what they, what they actually have. Some of us probably might get things on the first try, which is okay, they, that is your line, but who I'm speaking to is a person who got five rejections and said, in fact, I'll never apply for any masters, in fact, even this shavening, I will never try again, in fact, this DAD, I am done with all these scholarship things, let me just focus on, on what I have right now. Don't don't give up, yeah? Keep on, each each interview you attend, each scholarship you apply for and you fail, that is that is a learning lesson. Maybe you maybe you think about maybe my essay is not that good. Maybe next time instead of writing my essay, maybe I need to give David to read it and see whether it's okay or maybe I'm just uh, kidding myself. So ensure that yourself, inside yourself, you're being resilient. Um, when it comes to investing in youth-led ventures, I would say in terms of organizations such as, I would say, these organizations that I saw on the poster here, that is how we can support youth-led organizations. So as you grow in your career, as you, yesterday you are a youth, there are those youth who are younger than you, support those, support those organizations. It might not be money, it might be time. Because a lot of people might have time to give, may not have money to give. Give them opportunities like this room they have given us here. Um, give, look at their concept notes. Uh, link them to other people. Maybe I'm not, I'm not good in health system strengthening. I can, 
I can refer you to somebody who is able to do that. So as youth, let's em let's embrace in embrace um, participation in uh, the health system, but also supporting other youth-led ventures so that we can uh, so that we can participate in the health system. Another thing is also allowing youth to be leaders because it is in allowing participation. I think those people who are very good in advocacy. Advocacy cannot be done by people who are not in that situation. Like for instance, you take me and you want me to advocate for the boys in high school. I would probably say something right because I'm red, but am I the right person really? No. And that is why I think it has not gotten there yet. It's just in law, but it's not gotten there yet. They say that even in boards, there must be representation of the youth. Eh? Unfortunately, they write youth, women, and people with disability in one sentence. Yeah? So it becomes very easy to kick out the youth and just use the women. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that, yeah? but you can, easily, you can easily choose a youth and a woman. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, so instead of kicking out the youth and not giving them opportunities within government because it is written in one sentence. What is the role of private sector? Maybe I am private sector. I, I work with the private sector a lot. And our role basically within the private sector, one is providing, of course, resources. Private sector has resources. They're the ones who fund a lot of these activities. So private sector, so if you're looking for funding, majority of the time, look for money in private sector. Or if you're looking for investment in your ideas, private sector is the place for that. Um, of course, private sector offers employment. Uh, in essence, for the young professionals, might not be as lucrative as, especially when you're starting out, might not be as lucrative as you think. But when you look at the bigger picture, that is what Prof was trying to say. When you look at the bigger picture, you might actually be more advantage advantaged when you accept to participate in private sector because their room for growth is sometimes much faster than in government, or the opportunities are there. For instance, you are a young medical officer, you have finished your, your internship, and counties are not hiring. And then you get to private sector, you can get some people give internships. And they tell you, I'll give you an internship, but I'm not going to give you money for fair. But it's, a, it's, it's an internship in an area that you like. Uh, another thing is, I'll give you, yes, employment, and I don't give you 200. I, I mean, I'm also a startup. So you have you also have to think about the big picture because it's either your home going through what's happened and, and saying the way this world is so unfair, why are they not posting medical officers? If the government is shit, you're posting 20 tweets an hour. <laughs> that's a, that's that's an option, right? But the other option you could be working and getting whatever internship resources you have and growing. Um, and I think one of one of our many one of our doctors at KMA, Dr. Liz Walla, she's very good at supporting young people. Yeah. Um, at some point, she used to work for Amref, and at that point, she would advertise for internship placements for young doctors interested in health systems or interested in health financing. So you're here as a medical officer, and, they, and she's telling you our Amref policy says that interns, it does not matter whether you're an intern in education or intern as a doctor, our policy is interns get 20,000. So you as a doctor, will you take in the 20,000? Because that's their policy. Whether she wants to give you more or less, their policy is all interns are given fair. There's no, there's no salary. Maybe you can get a few more coins when you're sent somewhere, you get to the end, but the internship rate is the same. And for sure, there are, yeah, I can give example, there are two ladies that I know who took up those internships. And I can tell you for sure, their career right now, they are doing extremely, extremely well. Because after, after the internship, a project comes in your, in your area, guess who has experience? It is you. It is not the person who was sitting at home insulting Nakumicha and telling her that she's not a great doctor. It's okay to, uh, to be an advocate, yeah? Ad be an advocate, but also think about what grows you again as an individual. Um, another, and lastly, 
lastly, I think I will re-echo or echo what uh, our our keynote speaker who was before spoke. Build meaningful relationship. As you go through, as you go through everything, even as you sit here today, as you go home, even as you learn the various aspects of health system strengthening, if you want to participate, build meaningful relationships so that you're not calling to always ask for help. Yeah? You're also calling to say, I, I can do this, I can participate in this, I can. Do you, have a, do you have something you need written that I can write for you? Do you need, you know, do you need uh, somebody to shadow you? Even at this point in my career, I still, I still ask to shadow people because there are certain things I've not learned yet. So you shadow someone in something, you get to learn, and that is how you build relationship. I will even give an example how I came to become the CEO of KMA. It's because I shadowed the, that CEO, she's my friend. I shadowed her so much that it became very easy for me even during interview. It looks like they were interviewing somebody who was a deputy CEO, because I knew everything. There's no way you could deny me because I had, each, each time they'd ask, are you available for this meeting? I would go. As much as you might be there, the youngest person in the room. Self-sabotage, don't agree to that thing, eh? They say do things scared. Do it scared. Yes, you're scared, but just do it. You might be the young person in the room sent to represent KMA, but you go there and you say, I'm here to represent KMA. You have your message that you, are, you came with you. You go and say it, you might be the young person, but you have you are here in your capacity that you came to represent the president of KMA. So you might be the young person in the room, but do not allow yourself to sabotage. It, it will be better us to sabotage you than for you to sabotage yourself before you allow us to give you an opportunity. So thank you, David, for inviting me, and I will stop there.